I live in a pretty small town and I have a pretty quiet life in all honesty. I have an office job and I work some pretty long hours so I don't really go out all that much at night. On the night that this experience took place, I got a call from a friend of mine. To be honest, I almost didn't pick it up but I am really glad that I did. She had called to say that she needed a ride. I didn't mind, I didn't have any other plans. She needed to be picked up from a big supermarket. I guessed that she had bought a ton of things and she didn't want to take all of that on the crowded train home with her. I was happy to help, but it seemed to me a little late to be shopping. It was around 11pm when she called. I needed a couple of things, so I headed into the store to meet her. And the supermarket was almost empty at that time of night, but it usually is really busy during the day. We got our things, paid, and headed back out to the parking lot. I think that was about midnight at that point. A group of men came out of a nearby game center, sort of like an arcade. I think these guys came out because the place was about to close. They headed to their cars while talking to each other and looking over at us. My friend said to me that she wasn't feeling well and we decided to just get going. We pulled out of the parking lot and a couple of other cars followed on behind us. That was normal though, it was closing time and the lights in the retail park were going out. I noticed that my friend was quiet. I guess that that was just because she didn't feel well. I looked over at her and she looked pale and she looked at me and said, I think I know the guy in the car behind us. I didn't think much of it when she said that. I thought that it was just some coincidence. I went to look in the mirrors to see if I knew him too and then my friend suddenly said, don't look back. I realized why she was so uncomfortable and I tried to pull over to let the guy pass, but then my friend snapped at me and said, Don't stop the car, whatever you do. And I just did as she asked and continued. That's my ex-boyfriend. If you stop, I'm scared that he'll come and try to open the door. Okay, now this was serious, I thought. I made up my mind not to drive down the highway. I wanted to avoid any traffic lights, which would mean that we would have to stop. And when my car stops, the doors automatically unlock while the car is in drive. So I decided to take the back roads and, man, that was a terrible idea. Thinking back on it now, I should have probably gone to like a late night diner or a convenience store. You know, somewhere bright with lots of people around, but I think my friend would have freaked out if I even tried that. So I kept driving down these countryside lanes, the back roads, until my friend calmed down a little. The car behind was following every turn we made. The further we went from the city, the fewer cars were seen on the roads with us. It got to the point where it was literally just us on the road. The car behind was speeding up too, forcing me to go faster and faster. I asked my friend, why is he chasing us? She said, I think I made him angry. I don't want to stay at my place alone tonight. Then she began to cry and... I didn't really get my answer. The situation we were in was getting more and more unnerving. I didn't know how it was going to end, and I didn't want to consider all the possibilities. I kept driving. There wasn't much else I could do, but then something occurred to me. I had quite a small and light car, and the car behind was much bigger. What if I went down a narrow road? Maybe that would stop the guy from chasing us. He'd be scared to damage his car, I thought. I decided to take that risk and turn down the next narrow road that I found. I kept an eye on my navigation system to try to find a way out of there. I didn't want to be stuck down some dead end road. I needed to keep driving or at least get to some safe place because I didn't want to send my friend home in the state that she was in. I thought about trying the police but I knew the police would do nothing about that guy. It seems like they only help after the fact and never during. My friend was sobbing next to me, but she stopped to apologize for getting me into this mess. I mean, I should have sensed something was up. She hadn't ever called me for a ride from a supermarket before. She said she called me because she didn't have anyone else she could turn to. I told her that it was okay. I just wanted to know where I should be driving her. And she replied, Don't take me back to my house. If we did just lose him, that's where he'll be waiting. Can you take me to the train station? I said that she could stay at mine for the night, but she vehemently refused. She said that she had caused enough trouble. I realized something at that point. The stuff that she had bought at the supermarket looked like she had been planning to run away. She even had some camping equipment. 
I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't fully understand the situation, but I knew one thing. The man who was chasing us was very dangerous if running away for her life in our town seemed to be her preferred option. She said that she would stay in a hotel that night. She would get off the train far away and lay low. She was going to hotel hop too, make sure that her location changed every now and then. I felt for her, I really did. She said that she felt like he was always watching her and he knew how to find her. And that was so scary to me. I didn't want to ask her about her ex, but I was curious as to why she was so scared of him finding her. I said something like, he sounds like a really horrible guy. And she replies, it's not just him who'll be looking for me. It's his group of friends too. And that was even more frightening. Something really bad was going on. I managed to follow the narrow back roads back to the city and I got her to the station like she asked. I was confident that she wasn't following us anymore. I felt for sure that he had given up. She got out at the station and we found that the next available train would come at 6am. I couldn't leave her there for that long alone in the state that she was in. I asked her to come with me to a, like a McDonald's or something. I thought that there we could talk things over a little and I was right. She told me a little more about the situation and that ex of hers. She told me that he didn't take being broke up with very well. He attacked her and beat her up. He made threats against her family and friends and tried to use fear to coerce her into getting back with him again. He was also convinced that she had been with his friends. He said all this after she found out that he had been on a bunch of dating and hookup apps. One of her single friends showed her his profile and she confronted him. She said that his friends are a bunch of stalkers like him too. I was shocked and found it hard to follow her story. Personally, I think they could have been equally guilty of cheating by the sounds of things. Then she turned to me and said, I want you to forget about me, okay? I, I'm not going to have anything more to do with you. And at that point, it is very sad to lose a friend, of course, but equally, I didn't want to get involved with these weird guys and be chased by random men at night, and I just felt so conflicted. She began to cry again and kept saying, it's really my fault this time. After dropping her off at the train station and helping her onto the platform with her bags, she turned to me and gave me 10,000 yen and said, Thank you. I'll always be grateful for tonight. And that was the last time I ever saw my friend. I had tears in my eyes as I drove home from the station that night, but they felt like they instantly dried up when I noticed a certain car in the lane next to mine. I couldn't believe it. The guy who had followed me earlier was still out here looking for us. I got goosebumps but tried not to make it obvious that I had noticed him, and by some miracle he didn't appear to notice me or my car and after four or five pretty frightening minutes he turned off in a different direction to me. As soon as I got home I just completely crashed. It was the first time in a long time that I had been awake that late with that much adrenaline, and despite everything that happened that night I'm glad that I answered her call. I mean, what might have happened to her if I didn't is something I don't want to ask myself. And like I said, I never heard from her again. Now fast forward now, three months later, I got a call from my friend's number. I was really interested to see how she was doing, so I answered it straight away. And I quickly found out that it wasn't my friend on the other end of the phone. It sounded like someone wasn't even using a phone. And by that, I mean that it was some sort of computer talking and the voice at the other end of the line asked the following, Hi, have you heard from Beep? The man calling from her number seemed polite and friendly, but I knew that he was likely one of the guys who was chasing her. I was a little scared to say anything at first, but then I managed to say, oh, Actually, I haven't heard from her in a long time. I'm sorry I can't help you. Ah, is that so? Well, I'm so sorry to have bothered you then. And then the call was ended. I was so scared even though it wasn't happening to me. I had a way to contact her through a separate messaging app, but I didn't dare to use it just in case one of those guys or her ex had a way of tracking her messages. I hope she managed to start a new life, and although that call was scary, it told me that they hadn't managed to track her down. And if you're out there, please, stay safe, my friend.
This happened in Gifu, Japan. I've had one really scary experience worth sharing. Back when I was a student, I used to go camping by myself regularly, and at one point I was camping almost every weekend. I used to camp from Friday to Sunday out in the elements, and I really didn't mind where. I camped in fields and in the shade of the mountains. With no real friends at college, I guess I was trying to suppress my loneliness by exploring nature. On the night that this took place, I got on the train and headed out with no real direction in mind. I didn't bring a map and I didn't research where I was going to be camping. I was just kind of winging it. I knew that there would be mountains where I was heading, so I figured that I would easily find somewhere to camp. I got off the train and set off into the wilderness and eventually I found a nice area between two mountains. It looked like a pretty safe place, so I set up my camp for the night. I made a campfire dinner and then I retreated into my tent to read a little. Before I knew it, it was almost midnight. It was a quiet night, there was a breeze, but it wasn't that cold despite it being fall. I was comfortable in my tent. Well, that was until I heard the zipper at the front of the tent unzip. I panicked, but I tried to think logically at first. Was I trespassing on private property, or could this be something worse? I was worried that I was in danger. The tent flap was fully unzipped in a matter of moments, and then I saw a figure. A man was out there. He leaned his head into the tent, and I saw his face. It was just some old man. He looked very ordinary, the kind of guy that you would walk past in the street and hardly notice. As he leaned into my tent, he asked, Are you traveling through here? I couldn't wrap my head around what he was asking. I just shook my head from side to side to indicate no, and with that, the old guy zipped up the front flap and left. I was confused and pretty freaked out. I didn't spot a house in the area, and I think the closest one I saw was nearly a mile away. What the hell was this old guy doing out in the mountains so late? I started to wonder if I'd seen a ghost or something. I knew deep down that I had seen a real person though, but the absurdity of the situation had me questioning everything. Well, I guess that sleep was off the agenda for the night. I mean, there would be no possible way that I could sleep with some weirdo out there. If he was comfortable enough to open my tent, what else was this guy possibly going to do? I didn't know if he was a psycho or if he was armed or if he was a thief. I mean, he didn't look like any of those options, but I guess that it's possible that he could have been all three, and I couldn't sleep with that on my mind. While I was mulling over all that, I heard the sound of the zipper being pulled again. The front flap opened, and this time a completely different guy stuck his head through the opening of the tent. He asked me more or less the same question. Are you on a trip or vacation or something? I shook my head to indicate no again. I didn't know how to answer this guy and I wanted to give a similar answer as the first one that I gave. I didn't know what they were testing. There had to be a point to this weird line of questioning. When he heard my response, he zipped up the tent again and seemingly walked off someplace. And the second guy was younger. He was middle-aged and, again, very ordinary looking. I didn't know if I was being targeted or if this was the beginning of some kind of game. I didn't plan on sticking around to find out, so I decided to pack up my things as fast as I could. I was worried, though. I knew that it was dark out there. There was no moon out that night, and you know how dark it can get in the mountains and the woods, right? I didn't see either of those guys carrying flashlights. It just kept getting weirder and weirder. I needed to plan my way out. I honestly spent close to 20 minutes imagining what kind of scenarios would happen when I set foot out of my tent. I knew that I wouldn't be able to see where those guys were, and they could come at me from any angle. I imagined a kitchen knife being plunged into my back. I had no choice, though. I mean, I had to get out of the tent. I couldn't just sit there and wait for their first move. So, with my heart racing, I decided to step out. I equipped myself with my mag light for self-defense. I slowly went out, but I couldn't see anyone out there. I thought that this might be my chance to get all my stuff packed up and get the hell out. I was making promises with all the known gods that, if I got out of there safely, that this would be the last time I went on a solo camping trip. I was shoving things into my bag, but I stopped in my tracks when I heard the sound of approaching footsteps. I looked up and saw those two men's silhouettes. I just carried on with packing my stuff, but 
Then one of the men spoke up. Are you going home? It's the middle of the night. I replied this time and I said something along the lines of, Yeah, I had an urgent call. I gotta go. One of them replied, We didn't hear a phone ring. I naturally turned to face them at this point. They knew that I was lying, and I shone my flashlight at them and saw that they were wearing dark robes. They had masks perched on top of their heads as if though they had just pulled them off of their faces. There was something very disturbing going on out here. They stood there and watched me frantically get my stuff together, and a thought came to my mind that really scared me. It was like my internal voice said to me, it was a short life. I really thought that this could be the end. I thought that they were about to attack. They didn't do anything though. They just stood and watched. I got my things together and I just bolted. I heard something weird as I was running. I knew that there were more people out in the mountains that night. I could tell there was. I heard footsteps, branches snapping. I swear I heard someone laugh, but most chillingly of all, I heard what sounded like a choir of voices begin to murmur something. I tripped and stumbled and by the time I got to the foot of the mountain, I was covered in unseen cuts and bruises. I spent the rest of the night at the train station and I didn't get any sleep. As soon as the first train arrived, I joined the morning commuters and got out of there. I must have looked like a wreck. I was getting some strange looks as well. I kept my promise. That was the last time I went camping alone. It was a really terrifying experience. And I don't know what those people wearing robes and masks do out there in the woods and I don't really want to find out. I have the feeling that I got away with something that night. Maybe it was down to the way I answered the questions they asked. Maybe they thought that I was a local. I don't know, but if I told them that I was on a trip and I wasn't from that area, maybe I wouldn't be sharing the story with you. I am having some real difficulty sleeping tonight. I've been reading scary stories and that probably doesn't help. I read one that reminded me of an experience I had the last time that I had trouble sleeping and I figured I'd share it with you. I went back home this summer, and I'm writing this in September by the way. My hometown is really far away from where I currently live. During the journey home I fell asleep on the Shinkansen, the bullet train. I only wanted to sleep for about an hour but I slept for like four I think. I got home and greeted my parents, and after I had dinner with my parents and they went up to bed, I found myself unable to sleep. I was so restless and I knew that the next morning we were all going to be going on an important trip. I figured that the best thing I could do would be to take a walk. I hoped that that night air would just help me feel a little sleepy and wind down. I went to the local convenience store, I think I got there just after 1am. I went in and wandered over to the magazine rack in the corner. I was looking at the adult entertainment thinking that that might help me get to sleep, and it was at that point that I sensed something. I felt that horrible feeling you get when you just know that someone is watching you. I looked up to see an old man staring at me through the window of the convenience store. I thought, well, this is kind of awkward. And there I was looking through the specialist gentleman's material and unbeknownst to me, I was being watched. I felt like it would be even more awkward if I looked up at him directly in his eyes. I did however take a quick covert look at the guy while pretending to browse. I remember he had a dirty white t-shirt on and he was overweight. It didn't look like he had washed for a while, he looked very disheveled. It was obvious that he was staring at me and it wasn't something that I was willing to stand any longer. I moved away and into another aisle. I was looking at the drinks and I picked a relaxing tea and went to the register. The clerk behind the till fixed me with a look between nervousness and the awkward, and then I said, Hey, that guy out there, he looks a little off, right? He was just staring at me a minute ago. Uh, yeah, I actually noticed that, he replied. Are you the only one working tonight? I asked. Uh, yeah, that's right. I noticed that he was pretty young, and he looked scared too. I think that he must have been between maybe 18 to 20 years old, and I wasn't much older than him by the way, I was only 24. So I said to him, Hey, I don't like the look of that guy, do you mind if I just hang out here? 
I'll pretend to browse and hopefully after a while just go away. He looked at me like he had just been given a birthday present and said, Yes, yes, thank you. I guess he was just as creeped out by him as I was. I think I was there browsing and chatting with the clerk for about half an hour to an hour and it started to get a little light out. All the while, we were hiding out in the store from that weirdo, he remained out there staring in at us. At times, it looked like he was in deep contemplation, and at other times, it looked like there wasn't a single thought in his head. Something was just off. A truck pulled into the convenience store's parking lot, and as soon as it did, we saw that weird guy just sort of saunter off someplace, and the truck driver came in. He looked over at us and said, Did you see that guy out there? He's out there with a goddamn knife behind his back. I was shocked and scared, to be honest. I called a taxi as I didn't want to walk home, and the clerk called the cops. I didn't really realize how close I was to a situation that was potentially life-threatening. Stay safe out there and trust your gut. This happened when I was a newlywed. My husband and I went to visit his mother in his rural family hometown in Kyushu. He said that he was from a small town, but it was smaller than I imagined. Another reason we headed back to his hometown was because his father was in the hospital. My sister-in-law was a student, so she wasn't home. So that left his mother and my mother-in-law essentially home alone, and she didn't have a driver's license, so it made getting around in the countryside very difficult. She could walk to most places, and of course, there were buses and taxis, but occasionally, you just need a car, don't you? She needed a bunch of gardening supplies. We arrived in Kyushu on the Shinkansen. My husband would drive his mum around in his father's car. I was planning on going with them, but I suffered with anemia, and I almost collapsed on the train. When my mother-in-law saw me, she said that I looked pale. She told me that I would be better off staying home, and I didn't mind that idea. My husband's room had been left the way it was since he graduated from high school. Same bed, same desk, and I got into bed and shut my eyes. Now I should say that I'm a pretty deep sleeper. I experienced and slept through the great Hanshin earthquake, and I came out unscathed. Also, I have somehow slept through a 5.0 earthquake, too. I had no idea it happened, I just turned on the TV in the evening and saw the news, and it was truly shocking. So there I was, sleeping soundly on my husband's childhood bed for a while, I guess before I began to feel slightly restless. I put it down to being asleep in someplace different, you know, like when you miss the comforts of home or you wake up in the middle of the night at a friend's place and you're confused and the initial thought is, where am I? It was something like that. I wasn't used to sleeping alone, so when I thought I sensed some movement on the bed, I immediately thought that, ah, my husband is back home earlier than expected. And dreamily, I thought that he saw me sleeping and he felt like joining me for a while. After a few moments, I felt like something was off. He was a little more ambitious, shall we say, with what he thought that he could get away with at his parents' home. I was more than half awake at this point and I knew something was off. I felt something moving beneath the covers, beneath my skirt. I felt a hand try and part my legs and breathe on bare thighs. I opened my eyes, threw off the covers, and saw that it wasn't my husband. It was an old man in the bed. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He saw that I was awake and immediately tried to overpower me. I want to see what you look like. And that's what this guy said as he tried to grab at my clothing. And at first, I was speechless. I was in this stunned state that I couldn't believe it was happening. I couldn't scream right away, but then my brain kicked into gear. I leaned over to the bedside table, grabbed my phone and dialed the number for the cops. I kicked at the old man with all my might and he went toppling off of the bed. I took my chance and ran as fast as I could down the stairs. I heard the old man cussing at me and saying something else disgusting up there as he got to his feet. I bolted out the front door and ran across the street where I was immediately spotted by another old guy who was washing his car. I was screaming and it was all just so horrible. I screamed at the man for help and then I just began to cry. 
The wife of the guy who was washing his car came out and ushered me into their home to take refuge where I waited with them until the police arrived. While I was explaining the situation, my husband and mother-in-law returned home. As I was telling the police everything through tear-filled eyes and heavy sobs, the old man, the guy who got into bed with me, came out of my mother-in-law's house. He came out of the house and just sort of meandered off down the street as if though nothing had happened. That didn't work out too well for him because he was instantly arrested. Now my husband and his mother were back and were able to tell me a few things about that old man. It turned out that he lived just up the street on the opposite side. He was living with his two 40-something-year-old sons who didn't work. He didn't work either, and apparently he had a young wife, but she didn't live with him, and you wonder why, huh? It turned out that he was jealous of my husband and the life that he had with me outside of the small town. He told the police that because I was from the city and wearing different clothes and was, quote, glamorous, I looked easy to him. So he told the police when he broke in that he had committed no crime. He was simply trying to ascertain if I was an escort or not. Naturally, he was taken away in a police car. We were planning on staying that night, but I didn't want to after that. I don't think I was being difficult by wanting to go home. Before leaving, my husband and his mother informed me that the old man was a very important person in their town, and I didn't care. What that man tried to do would have been irreversible. I was fully prepared to sue this man, but I was asked multiple times to find a more amicable resolution. They kept telling me that they wanted a peaceful end to the matter, and I was aghast. It wasn't as simple as that. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't get them to see that. In the end, there was no apology, no settlement, and no punishment for this old man, and I cried myself to sleep that night. Is this just something that just happens in small towns? God... I hope not. I'm from the countryside. In fact, my family home lies just behind the shadow of a very tall mountain, and the land that mountain stands on is actually owned by my grandfather. Our family have always been happy to allow villagers to use the land as long as a small portion of their profits are shared with us, and by that I mean the grounds are free to walk, the fields are free to work, and the game is free to hunt, and to me that doesn't seem that much of a bad deal. To my family's history of being somewhat more than kind with this arrangement, we have been beset by thieves over the years. Since our family wanted to make sure we continued this community spirit, the older men in my family offered to patrol the mountain ranges at night in search of these thieves. My family would often remind me of areas of the mountain range that would be dangerous at night. In other words, it was for adults only, no children allowed. It didn't stop me and my friends exploring, though. We found out pretty quickly why the adults didn't want to play in those areas. For one, the wildlife, but more realistically, there was a pretty deep cave, and to us kids, that cave was one of our favorite playgrounds. So that leads me to this experience I had when I was a kid, which... I'm certain will live with me for the rest of my days. I was playing in the forbidden areas of the mountain range like normal in the cave, and all of a sudden I had the urge to pee, so I decided to head out and do it behind a tree. We were usually nervous about being in places where we were explicitly told not to play in, but being caught peeing out there really gave me the willies. If you will, uh, pardon the expression, I was basically double scared of being caught. I kept looking around to make sure the coast was clear, but then, as I was midstream, I saw someone. There was a stranger walking up towards the cave, and he was down by the river. I shot back behind the tree. I didn't even have a chance to pull my pants up. It was some middle-aged guy. I didn't know the man. I hadn't ever seen him before. I knew everyone who was permitted to use the mountain range. It was like a big village. My family had been talking about someone who was stealing mushrooms. It made sense that this stranger could be a thief. He was carrying a backpack and was clearly on the lookout for something. If this was the thief that my family had been worried about, then I didn't want to be seen by him. I stayed as still as possible out of sight, in the trees and bushes. I felt like such an idiot. This was exactly what I had been warned about. I watched the stranger. It looked like he was looking for something and he was being cautious. I kept an eye on him to make sure that he didn't spot me or come too close. 
I mean, I had no plan if he came close. I was just scared to take my eyes off of him. I watched him for a while, and then I noticed someone was approaching from behind him, and I knew that guy very well. He was my uncle. He approached the stranger, and he was holding a shovel. He told the guy, and it looked like those two were having a conversation. I was too far away to make out anything that they were saying. My uncle seemed to be admonishing the guy, giving him a real telling off, you know. The stranger, or should I say thief, took off his backpack at what looked like the order of my uncle. My uncle then snatched the thief's backpack. He opened it and I saw my uncle get very angry at him, and then something happened that I didn't think would ever be a possibility. My uncle smacked the thief across the back of the head with a shovel. The thief went limp and fell flat on his face in the dirt. My uncle then dragged the stranger into the river and watched as his lifeless body bobbed downstream. My uncle then walked off in the opposite direction like nothing had happened. And that scared the hell out of me. My uncle was the younger of the two brothers, the elder being my dad, and man, my uncle had my sides aching so many times when I was a kid. He was hilarious. But in that moment, he didn't look anything like himself. He looked so cold and expressionless. It gets worse because he came around to our house for dinner that night and I had to sit opposite him knowing what I knew. He was smiling and joking as usual. It was like nothing had happened. At one point he looked me right in the eyes and I thought to myself for a brief second while he and my father spoke about trespassers on the mountain range, do you know? The thief didn't ever come back. I'm not sure what happened to him but I can guess based on what I saw. If he did manage to get away... He never went to the police or anything. I learned about that adult world they warned me about with their off-limit areas that day. And I really don't think I could ever look at my uncle the same. This happened to me in my early 20s, and as a direct result of this experience, I have developed a strong fear and mistrust of the opposite gender, and for that reason, I'll be keeping my identity anonymous. It happened one night when I was on my way home from work. I got off the train at my usual station, and I was walking down the street in the direction of home. I had my earbuds in, and I was listening to music. It was just an ordinary night. As I was walking, I sensed a presence behind me, so I naturally glanced back. I guessed that I might have been in someone's way or something. I looked back to see a man on a bicycle. He was wearing a surgical mask, so I couldn't see his face clearly. He looked young, and when I heard his voice, I guessed that he was about the same age as me. He said something along the lines of, Hey, when I saw you, I knew that I just had to stop and talk to you. You're so my type. Are you free right now? Realizing that this guy was just trying to hit on me, I pretended that I couldn't hear anything over my music. I just kept walking, hoping that he would just leave me alone. Hey, can't you hear me? Are you busy? What, what is it? Why don't you just give me your contact information? I won't even contact you. Then why the hell do you want my number, I wondered. I realized that creep wasn't going to get the hint, so I decided to go a little stronger. I made a big gesture of turning my head away from him and up my pace so he wasn't as close. He did freak me out, but it only took me about another three or four minutes to get home, so I was just focused on what I wanted to do once I got in. I told myself soon I would be sitting on my sofa watching a movie behind a locked door, and I didn't look back and I just kept walking. I get to my place and I have to go along some busier streets and some quieter ones. When I turned off to head down a quieter street, I noticed something. Suddenly from behind me, I heard some kind of clanking sound. It sounded like metal rubbing against metal. I turned around to see what was coming, and I saw amidst the darkness of the night, I saw a guy wearing a surgical mask coming right at me on his bicycle. I thought that our brief and horrible exchange was over, but it seemed pretty clear to me now that he'd been following me. My first thought was a really strange one. Even if I ran home as fast as I could, he would still catch me. It was true. He had a bike, and with that thought came a kind of internal avalanche of fear. I was confused and scared, and I wanted nothing more than to be off of those dark streets. 
I remember that there was a coin laundry nearby that I sometimes use, and I figured that I could get there and into the light in about 10 seconds, and there might still be people there too. If I was lucky enough to find someone in the laundromat, then that guy would probably go away. If not, I could lock the door from the inside if I have to, and then I could call the police. I turned and started sprinting. The metal clanking sound was getting louder, which I guess now was probably the pedals of his worn-out bike. I knew without turning around that that meant that he must be pedaling faster in pursuit of me. I threw open the door to the laundromat and got in without the creep catching up to me. Of course, no one was in there. There were no other customers. And that was just the kind of luck that I was having that night. I locked the door. I knew how to lock the door because I had seen the owner do it. I locked the door and I headed right to the back of the room. I was shaking with fear and breathing heavily. I grabbed my phone and as I was frantically trying to unlock it, I saw a shadow appear in front of the door outside. The guy who was following me had arrived and he dropped his bike to the ground and started trying to open the door, but then he realized that I had locked it and this angered him. Hey, open the door. Come on, just open it. Come on, it's not like I'm, I'm going to do anything to you. I won't do anything. Okay, fine, just give me your number. I, I won't contact you, but if you, if you give it to me, I'll, I'll go away. Just, just open the door. Come on, open up. He was saying all sorts of weird stuff like that. And I remember because he said he wanted my number, but he wouldn't contact me earlier. And now he was saying, open the door. I'm not going to do anything to you. The way he was double speaking really creeped me out. It was like his true intentions were slipping out when he was getting frustrated. I wondered what more would happen to me if he got even more frustrated. He started pounding on the door with his clenched fists and shaking the handle, and the door was shaking in its frame. The door was primarily made of glass, so I wasn't sure how much of a beating it would be able to take. I was absolutely terrified of what was going to happen to me if this man was going to get in. It was time to do something. I couldn't just stand there cowering and waiting for him to get in. I yelled at him. I told him that I was going to call the police and that they would be here any minute. And I said, you better stop, you idiot. He stopped banging on the door and calmly dropped his arms down to his side. He looked at me in the eyes and I knew that he hated me. And I think I had upset his ego by calling him an idiot. He then pointed at me and said, I'm going to kill you. And then he turned and kept muttering something, but I couldn't hear it, and then he picked up his bike and left. I couldn't move for another ten minutes, but I had to when an actual customer came to use the laundromat. I unlocked the door with my trembling hands, and then I called the police. I made sure someone stayed with me on the phone until I got home. I got home safely that night, but I hated that night at home, though. Because that horrible experience happened on a road I regularly used to get home, it led to a lot of fear and negativity during my commutes to work, and it really ruined my life. In order to get back to being myself again, I had to move. I had to get away. I couldn't live each day wondering if I would run into that crazy man again or not. Thankfully, I never did, but it scares me, still to this day, knowing that he could still be somewhere out there. I've had some horrible experiences in the past, and I want to share these with you. It all happened about two years ago. I got a job and moved out of my family home. One night, I was walking home from the station as usual after work. It wasn't a long walk. It only took about five minutes in total. I was heading home that night and felt like something was out of place. I felt as if though someone was following me. I turned around, but I didn't see anyone. I thought that I was just being paranoid or something, but this odd feeling lasted for about a week, every time I headed home after school from the station. It bothered me so much that I spoke to a work colleague about it, and he told me, if you're worried or scared about what's happening, then why don't you just go to the police? I didn't think that I had anything to go on. I mean, what would they do about it if I told them that I thought that I was being followed? I tried not to think about it, but then one night, something happened and my paranoia was justified. I got a letter at work. It was addressed to me. I opened it and shrieked as it read, I am always watching you. 
I showed it to my boss, and he really didn't seem to care. He wasn't interested at all, to be honest, and it really scared me. And I didn't know if it was a prank because I had told some colleagues about my fears. I thought that that would be the worst thing that would happen, but I was proven wrong. One time I got a call from a private number and I picked it up and a male voice said, Are you just getting in? A little earlier than usual tonight, huh? I was really scared and full of anxiety, but somehow I managed to muster up the courage to ask in what I guess was a very shaky voice, Who are you? And knowing full well that this was likely the person who had been following me and who had sent that creepy letter to my workplace, so I said, you're the guy who's following me. To which he replied something along the lines of, oh, you noticed. <laughs> what a sharp sense of intuition you have. I'm surprised. And I replied that I was calling the police. That doesn't matter, he said back instantly. I felt my spirit sinking in my chest like a lead weight, so I just hung up, and I spent the night awake late thinking that there was nothing I could do about the situation, and I felt so helpless. I barely slept, but I did come out of the situation thinking that it wasn't completely hopeless. I figured that whoever was stalking me knew my work and my train schedule, so I decided to work by car. It was a little more inconvenient, but after that call, I didn't feel safe sat opposite a stranger on the train. I was still scared, though, and I still talked to my coworkers about what was going on. For a long while, there was nothing. I figured that the stalker must have given up and lost interest. My fears returned when I opened a letter one night after work, and the letter hadn't been addressed. It was hand-delivered. I knew the sender before I read a single word, but this is what it said. Yesterday, a friend came over and you and her talked about me. I'm so glad you care about me and that I'm part of your life. Throughout the letter, it spoke of the contents of my friend and I's conversation. It was horrible. It was like someone knew my inner thoughts. I thought about it for a long while and the most logical conclusion I came to was where someone had somehow hidden a listening device in my home. If that was true... I felt like it was 1000% true at the time. It must mean that someone had gotten in my apartment. Some stranger must have gotten in. If you ever suspect that this might have happened to you, you will know how that realization makes you feel so incredibly violated. I sat there thinking, whoa, I must have had a bunch of friends and coworkers over, not to mention the previous tenant lived here and anyone they had brought in. I have had mostly women over since I myself am a woman, and come to think of it, I've had a mix of guys and girls over for drinking parties once in a while. Some of the guys have been over too, and some other friends as well. I had no idea if any of them were shady or capable of becoming a stalker. I couldn't figure out who the guy harassing me was, and I also couldn't really move. I just didn't have the money, and I really didn't want a couple of weird letters and calls giving me a reason to leave an apartment that I really enjoyed. I mean, what was the alternative? go back home and live with mom and dad, they weren't exactly local. Talking about my parents will send me down a whole nother rabbit hole and on top of that, I didn't have savings or anything. I couldn't move even if I wanted to. Things quieted down after that, like it did before and I just kind of thought or maybe hoped is the operative word here that the stalker had moved on. I think about three months went by incident free. I had returned to my usual work-life rhythm and my confidence was back, and I carried on like nothing had happened. Things were all good for a while until I came to a realization. I was missing something from my bedroom. Underwear. I was missing some underwear. At first I thought of all the usual kind of thoughts like, oh, did I lose it? I can understand me losing one set of underwear like a bra or panties, that just happens to everyone, right? But three items? That's pretty weird, isn't it? I live on the second floor of an apartment block. I never dried my clothes outside on my balcony, and therefore for them to go missing meant that they must have been removed from my apartment. I thought that something very strange was going on. It was terrifying. I returned one night to find a memo attached to the fridge. It was just your run-of-the-mill post-it note, actually. Occasionally, my mom would come over and leave me something in the fridge, so I thought that this was just my mom looking out for me. 
One look at the post-it without reading its full contents told me that it wasn't written by my mother. No one in my family, actually. And the post-it read, Have you noticed that your underwear is missing? I guess you wonder where it's gone. I have it. I was scared, like to the point in which you just don't know what to do. I was being terrorized, and I was scared. It's the easiest way I can say it. And so I called the police. And I must have sounded so weird. I must have sounded so dumb, but I told them everything. They were not the most helpful people to contact in that situation. I mean, they listened, but they would always try to talk me back around to a message. And that message was, just move. It'll be easier for everyone if you just move apartments. That seemed to be the message coming out of my colleagues and friends too, but once again, I have to say I couldn't afford it. I mean, I guess that is great advice for someone who could afford it, but I really couldn't. So I hatched a genius plan. I figured that if I replaced the locks in my doors, then my troubles would end. I mean, replacing locks seemed like a lot cheaper and a lot less hassle than moving. I felt like it worked though. I even left a pile of my underwear freshly laundered on my coffee table for about a week or so and they remained untouched. To be honest, it was only a temporary fix. I mean, I couldn't live there really. I was a little reluctant at the time to admit that and I guess that was down to it being the first place I had ever lived alone. I was unwilling to give it up. I couldn't afford to move and I didn't want to be home alone at night. I decided to solve both problems by getting a night shift. I did it on the hush-hush. I just wanted cash in hand, and if my day job knew that I was moonlighting, I might have been in trouble. I know, I know, their sympathy for me and my situation was truly heartwarming, huh? I didn't care if my new part-time job kept me out of the house at night and helped me to save up, and I decided to use some of the money I saved up to get some security cameras or surveillance cameras, I don't know which is the right terminology. I thought that I found who was stalking me, and if I could show that evidence to the police, then I could stop it all and maybe I wouldn't have to move. In Japan, honestly, stalking laws are pretty lax. They won't do much until something quote-unquote happens. If they weren't going to help me, I figured that I might as well try and help myself, right? I was really scared, I should say. I hated it. I hated that I had to work two jobs and be stressed all day and night. I was afraid of every guy that passed me on the street and the ones who politely smiled scared me the most. It wasn't their fault though. Scared but working, that's how I would describe that period of my life. Things got a little better when a friend of mine reached out to me, and he met me at work for lunch. We were close friends back at the start of our careers so it was great to see him again, and he was really sweet and he listened to my complaints and troubles and tried to offer advice. He was such a nice guy during the tough time that I just ended up relying on him whenever I was down or upset. After changing the locks, I felt as if though I was free again. Nothing happened for the longest time, and then about half a year after the lock change, something happened. I had to leave my job due to family reasons. I was very disappointed to be quitting. I guess for some, it must have looked as if though I was throwing the towel in or something. I certainly felt that way at times, but in all honesty, it was out of my control. If I wanted to leave due to pressure or other circumstances out of my control, like, oh, I don't know, being stalked? Well, anyways, since I had to move back home, I guess I had to break the news to everyone. I had a farewell party at work, and I broke the news to the guy who had helped me through the tough times. And when he messaged me first, he said something along the lines of, Hey, it's been a while. How you doing? And we chatted for a bit and he invited me to meet him somewhere kind of close by and I accepted. The guy who had been good to me got in touch and offered to come and see me. And I felt great about it. It was like someone from a life I had before was coming to save me from my current life. I guess that doesn't make much sense unless you're me. Being back home was rough and I guess that I was feeling nostalgic. I was working for a new company at the time and he got in touch and the place he wanted to meet wasn't that far away from my new job. We walked around the park we agreed to meet at and we caught up, talked about work and life and a couple of memories. I told him how I quit my job, stuff like that, and he seemed to be happy that I was doing well. I wanted to get across that I was in a much better place and genuinely a little happier than I thought I would have been to move back home. But then he said something strange. I guess you didn't care about my feelings then, huh? That's really insensitive, you know? 
I didn't really understand what he was talking about and where it was coming from. I wondered if I had accidentally said something rude to him or took his sympathetic ear for granted, so I replied, Oh, I'm sorry, I guess I shouldn't have unloaded all my trauma on you during those rough days. I thought you didn't mind. Do you not want to hear all that stuff? And he replied as quick as a flash, Yeah, I hate stuff like that. It went super quiet and there was an atmosphere after he said that. I didn't feel like talking to him anymore. He suddenly leaned over towards me and covered my mouth with his hand. I was so scared and shocked by his actions that I literally couldn't breathe. As soon as he did that, I knew that this was the guy who had been stalking me, and I began to tremble. Even though I felt as if though I couldn't speak, I managed to utter a few words out to the effect of, You followed me. You were in my apartment. <laughs> oh, good for you, huh? She finally notices. God, I never knew you were this insensitive. I thought we were friends. I, I, I didn't know, I said. <laughs> we are different people, aren't we? I wanted you to be mine and fast. I tried to show my intentions for months, but oh no, here I am ending up as the goddamn friend. A role I've played before. I mean, God, how stupid are you? Can't you just read the signs? I was shaking like a leaf. He had one hand over my mouth and one clamped on my shoulder. Why did you quit work, by the way? What the hell was that about? Had you been a little more mindful, a little more aware of your surroundings, you might have noticed me sooner. I stuttered some kind of muffled reply and he cut me off. If you can't have the foresight to think of others, then why should they care about your troubles? I had only known his gentle and kind side, before that day I didn't know he was capable of such a blatant display of anger. I could never have imagined that he would flip out like that. I struggled and tried to break away from him but he was too strong. He scared the living hell out of me with what he said after that. Listen, relax, I don't want you to be mine in a place like this, but if you keep behaving like you are resisting, then I'll do it here. The park was positively empty, and he must have known that it wasn't a popular one. It felt as if though we were the only two people there. And just when things looked their bleakest and I thought that I could see a look of dark contemplation dance across his face, I saw something else. Or should I say, someone else. A dog walker entered the park. I believe that this was highly unexpected for him, so he let go of me for a split second to appear normal, I guess. I wriggled free from his grasp. I looked toward the dog walker and I wanted to plead with her with my eyes and show her that I wasn't there by choice. When I locked eyes with the dog walker I realized that I recognized them. I knew her. She was an ex-co-worker. She rushed over to me and her dog was with her and it wasn't a very small dog and the creep started fast walking towards the exit of the park and I was left hyperventilating in her arms. I think that the only word I could muster out was, why? She replied, I thought he was following you. She told me later that he made no secret that he liked me. He told numerous people at work that he had a crush on me, and it felt like I was the only one who didn't know. When all the stuff started happening to me at work, people naturally looked his way. He quit the company right before the locks got changed. I didn't know he quit because I barely knew this guy existed until he came in when I was at my lowest point. And apart from when I met him at the start of working at that company, I didn't ever see him at work, and he was a little older than me. He was told by someone at work that if anything else happened to me or my place, then the police would be called. And that was when he left, I guess. That was when things went quiet for me, too, and it all started to make sense. I moved into a new place after all of this happened and I think the company I worked for is still going and I'm miles and miles away now though. It's a horrible time for me, I didn't ever go back to that secluded park again and to think how close I came to having something so irreversibly horrible being done to me is something that terrifies me on a daily basis. I have been reluctant to post this, 
It's just way too close to home. But you know what? I don't really have anyone to turn to for advice, so, you know, if you have any clue what I should do next, well, I'm all ears. My girlfriend is a victim of stalking. I'm not going to mention her name or even where she lives just in case the stalker is reading this. My girlfriend goes to college, university. She was living at her parents' home at the time this happened. Thankfully, her parents didn't live too far away from campus. I heard from one of her friends that someone had been calling her from an unknown number and following her home after classes. I was so shocked and disgusted at that. One of her friends said that someone grabbed her on the shoulder on the way home. I just couldn't believe what I heard. I decided I would keep an eye on her when she walked home, but at a distance, just to make sure she got home safely. Plus, I didn't want to make her feel like I was escorting her. I did this whenever I was free, which was pretty often actually. If I wasn't able to make it there in person, I would sometimes give her a call. Honestly, she hung up on me more often than not, and when she was walking home, it almost sounded as if she was sobbing sometimes. I really felt for her, you know? I didn't really know how to help her, but then I thought of something. I heard my girlfriend ask her friend if she could go and stay with her, because she was so stressed out by all the stalking. I decided I would make use of my paid annual leave to stand guard outside her friend's apartment. I was going to patrol the area and make sure that they were both okay. I had to be prepared to step it up if the stalker was prepared to up his game. My girlfriend was going to be staying over at her friend's place, and I knew her friend lived alone. That made both of them seem pretty vulnerable to me. They were definitely targets in a stalker's eyes. I didn't really need to bust in and ruin their night. They didn't even have to know I was there, really. I just needed to watch over them, by any means necessary. I'm not that familiar or friendly with her friend anyway, so it would have been a shock if I just invited myself into her home. I was volunteering my time to ensure their safety. I wanted them to have a normal night and not even know I was there, so I just stood watch outside the building. I saw my girlfriend arrive and enter her friend's apartment. I watched on looking out for suspicious people. I saw the lights dim in the apartment and then eventually go out when the hour was late. The apartment was enveloped in darkness. I took that opportunity to call my girlfriend to check in with her. She hadn't been taking many calls lately because of that stalker, but since she was with her friend, she answered. I didn't know how long I would have before she would cut me off. She was probably nervous or scared, so I tried to say a few words to reassure her quickly. I wanted her to know she was safe because I was close by. So I said, Hey, don't worry. I'm close by. It had been a while since we spoke on the phone, actually, so I guessed she might have been surprised to hear my voice again. It seemed like she was still terrified by this damn stalker. Her response to my kind words was little more than a short, sharp scream. I heard her friend in the background question her. Is that the stalker? She asked. There was a bit of a scuffle, and I think that her friend took the phone off of her. I was surprised that the stalker had the gall to appear when I was out on patrol so close to my girlfriend. So I rushed over to the apartment building to brace myself for an encounter. Looking up at her friend's place, I saw the lights go on. I asked her over the phone, Are you okay? I could hear my girlfriend crying in the background. She sounded like an absolute mess. The only words I could make out were, Help me. Then I saw the window open above me and I locked eyes with my girlfriend's friend. She looked down at me and ended the call. She probably realized that they were safe, but I wonder who she called next, as I could still see her talking up there. Well, I needed to know who she was calling, so I went to her apartment door and I just started knocking. After a short while, a few policemen arrived. I told the policemen that I had the situation under control and I was going to find the stalker. And you'll, you'll never guess what happened next. They mistook me for the stalker. C can you believe that? I actually got arrested. They said that my girlfriend's friend identified me as the stalker. I told them that this was just a simple misunderstanding and we could resolve it, but they didn't listen. They took me to their police car and I was sat down in the back. 
I told them that the real stalker must be hiding nearby, and they would be better off to go looking for him instead of arresting a guy who's watching over those two women, protecting them. They took me back to the police station and I was questioned. I told them everything. I told them about me and my girlfriend and they didn't seem to believe that we were an item. They're pretty dumb cops if you ask me. They forced me to sign some stupid documents, but signing them meant that they were releasing me. Since then, the number of police patrols near my girlfriend's apartment has increased. I guess that I can cut back on my role as her escort and maybe even watch over her a little less. It's been a year since all that happened. It seems as if my girlfriend is in a much better place. When I see her, it looks like she's gaining her confidence. I know what time she gets her coffee in the morning, and I make sure I'm there just to see how she's doing. Well, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I don't want to sound anxious, but I have a feeling that my girlfriend is kind of moving on. I know I haven't seen her as much as I used to. I could probably do better in that respect, but... She just can't move on, right? I deserve at least a reason for why and a chance to fight for her. Like I said, it's been a year. And the police presence is gradually reducing. What if the stalker came back? What if he was waiting for his chance for the police to back down? She doesn't seem concerned by the idea that the stalker could come back. Anyway... I'm thinking of going to see her this weekend. It's really been a while. I honestly can't wait to see the look on her face. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. And if you got a story, be sure to submit it to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over on email, and you might even hear the story featured on a new video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, Mojo Jojo.